Give us a sense of, of, what, of what the state of play was with NATO just in advance of the Munich speech. Uh, well, I want to roll back, if I may, a little bit earlier. Um, one little known uh, bit of history is that in the early Yeltsin years, 1993, 1994, uh, Strobe Talbot and I think Bill Clinton actually had a conversation with Yeltsin in the context of our walking up to the first enlargements of NATO, the first post-Cold War enlargements of NATO, about Russia's future with NATO and about whether Yeltsin could ever see a future for Russia where it would change enough and NATO would change enough that Russia could be a NATO member. And Yeltsin was actually, in 1993 and 1994, a little bit interested in that. So, you know, we were thinking initially, strategically, that NATO could become this broad pan-European security organization in the context of a Russia that was really getting democratic, that was really willing to live within the Helsinki rules and values. Um, but then by 1995, I don't know whether it was internal pressure or whether uh, Yeltsin just began to get more traditional in his views. He at one point said, Russia's too big for NATO. We would swamp you, you know. And, and then by the time you get uh, Putin in the picture in 1998, uh, there's this perception that any enlargement is, can only be seen in zero-sum terms. And I think Putin comes into office with that, that he never gets over that Soviet view of NATO, that it was founded to oppose us. There's no way we could be friendly with it, et cetera. And remember that we also did, we had two rounds of trying to create a relationship between NATO and Russia. Uh, the first uh, was in 1997, 98, when we created the uh, permanent joint council where it was the members of NATO and Russia meeting bilaterally. That didn't really work, and the Russians claimed that, you know, they weren't treated like a member of NATO. They were treated like the opposition bilateral force on the other side of the table. So then when uh, Bush 43 comes into office, we try to reconfigure it, and this was in the context of trying to reset the relationship then, and we create the NATO-Russia Council, which uh, I, was, I worked on, I worked on both of them, in fact, where we agreed to treat the Russians like a member of the alliance in that context, and they actually sat in alphabetical order like a NATO member. Uh, but again, it didn't work because um, not only Putin, but everybody in the bureaucracy in Russia couldn't get past this zero-sum sense that if something was good for the West, good for NATO, then it had to be bad for Russia. And of course, the Balkan Wars were uh, part and parcel of that. Even though we did end up working together in Bos uh, Bosnia, we did end up working together in Kosovo. Uh, so the stage is set as we start to take new NATO members, uh, first in the Clinton administration and then more in Bush 43, that this is a physical encroachment, that this is a loss for Russia, rather than Russia seizing the opportunity, even as NATO was moving towards it, to also move towards NATO. And it also suited uh, Putin's narrative of grievance, I would say, his rallying cry to um, uh, rule Russia the way he increasingly wanted to and to close down some of the democratic institutions. Remember that in 2004, he goes after the Russian press. He takes down most of the independent television stations, starts going after the newspapers. 2004 is also when he goes after, starts going after oligarchs who don't toe the line, big Russian businessmen. Your choice is either to collaborate with the Kremlin uh, or end up on the wrong side of a tax investigation and end up in exile like Berezovsky or in prison like uh, Khodorkovsky. Um, so Putin is really beginning to uh, re-autocracize, if you will, uh, the Russian state. 
And part of his reason for doing that, part of his explanation to the Russian people is that there are enemies abroad. So the NATO enlargement piece is very convenient. Uh, so by 2006, NATO has expanded significantly uh, on his watch. Um, and he sees his what's left of the former Soviet republics in his mind. By, the, by then, we've admitted the Baltic states. But Georgia and Ukraine both looking for a closer NATO relationship, and I think that he, um, you know, perceived that as a threat to his leadership model, and he was bound and determined to stop it. So, in a way, he's using NATO to help him domestically, as he heads to a statement in Munich uh, to the world about uh, other things. Take me to the Munich speech. Walk me in. Who's there? What's it about? What do you think it's about? What do you think he's going to say? Why are you there? Et cetera. So the Munich Security Conference for 30, 40 years has been sort of the Super Bowl of transatlantic uh, security conversations. It starts the winter semester of diplomacy. Everybody's coming out of Christmas and thinking about uh, what we can and should be doing together, both in terms of European security, but also in terms of working together globally. Uh, so everybody is there. There are foreign ministers from uh, countries from the United States and Canada all the way to Russia, but now increasingly there's a global footprint as well. Chinese are there, and Iranians are there, and Indians are there. Uh, a lot of media attention. Uh, traditionally, world leaders who are new to office come and make a sort of inaugural statement about how they want to work together. Um, it was done uh, by the Bush 43 cabinet when they came in. Um, it was done by uh, Vice President Biden when uh, President Obama came into office. So, um, and Putin, the, the Russians had traditionally come, but they'd come at the level of foreign minister. I don't think we'd ever had a Russian leader at Munich. Um, that may be wrong. Maybe, maybe Yeltsin came, but I, but I don't remember. And when a world leader gives a speech on the opening day of the Munich Security Conference, it is generally seen as a statement of how they perceive their country's relationship with the rest of the European and transatlantic family, mm -hmm. as well as an ideological statement about what can and can't be done together. So I think there was perhaps still a little naivete in 2007 uh, that if we just found the right projects of collaboration with the Russians, that Putin would continue to evolve, that we could reverse uh, some of the domestic crackdown that had happened, that there was still a chance to integrate Russia as a uh, democratic, peaceful European state that wanted to collaborate with the European family, the transatlantic family, on global issues. Uh, so when Putin comes in and gives his uh, view of the world, and it is not only completely zero-sum, uh, your model is expansionist and aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis states like ours, um, but also indicting of this notion of a big community of democratic states and goes back to sort of multipolar, a definition of multipolarity mm -hmm. that was really very 19th century checks and balances, if you will. Um, you know, I'm going to check your power because otherwise you're going to roll over us. Um, I think that was sort of uh, the, the end of dreams as somebody I'm close to coined for something else. Mm -hmm. and, and your reaction at the moment? I mean, is it a, is it a jaw dropper, head shaker? What is yeah, it? Yeah, I was sitting in the audience. I was the US ambassador to NATO at the time, so NATO ambassadors would always go. I think I was uh, four rows back, and you could uh, almost feel the humidity from the spittle that was spewing. Um, I think 
that uh, yeah, it was it was pretty shocking because it was pretty aggressive at a time when we were still hoping to reel in a better relationship. Um, so I don't know how to ask this, but so 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 that's basically. The end of Bush. That's just, really, yeah. Just to also remind that it was only three years after, or two and a half years after, we had reconfigured the NATO Russia relationship to try to include Russia more, to try to work more together, uh, to try to manage this anxiety about NATO enlargement by having more of the global projects done together in the NATO Russia forum. So clearly that hadn't worked. Yeah. So was it clear um, when you when you all got up and left and walked out of there and you called Washington or something? Was it what what does one say at a moment like that? Hey, the, this is this is over. Or you know, I I don't think that you ever give up. Nor should we give up at this moment in having a better relationship with Russia. 140 million people who I am personally confident uh, would like to live in a freer, more open, more prosperous society and would like to do more with us. So you don't give up. You just say to yourself, wow, that guy um, is living in a place where um, his view of us has gotten uh, really hard really paranoid, really negative, and it takes a professional diplomat anyway to a place where you say, we better see him more, we better engage with him more, we better uh, give him more information than he's getting in this uh, increasingly closed society and increasingly closed circle of advisors that he finds himself in. Putin is done with Bush, and Bush is definitely done with Putin. Uh, is that the state of play at the end of the Bush administration? I, I and think does there, it matter? Um, yeah, I think there was, there was distrust and disappointment on both sides. That's also true at the end of the Obama administration. Um, now, might it have been possible to work more intensively with Putin in 2003, 2004, and satisfy enough of his needs so he would have seen things in less zero-sum way? Um, maybe, but I'm not sure, because his view of the world fundamentally was so Soviet, and it didn't evolve uh, the way the view of others in his generation evolved. Um, now, I agree with those who say that uh, the first disappointment was that he thought after September 11th uh, that the U.S. and Russia together would be holy warriors against this evil of al-Qaeda. Um, but we were also disappointed because we didn't feel that the Russian intelligence services uh, after we were quite forthcoming about what we were seeing, shared much, um, that we were always in a relationship deficit. We were trying to give them more to elicit more, and they were very cagey. Now, whether that was masking the fact that they actually didn't know very much, um, perhaps Putin thought that they knew more, or whether uh, that fundamental distrust was never going to be overcome. Um, but that was part of the problem, and it went both ways. So let's go to 2000, zoom ahead in the fast forward machine to 2011. Uh, he's running again, if running is what he does. Yeah. Uh, there are protests in the streets. Uh, uh, so describe the, the nature of the protests. Describe what you think, what you saw as the as the impetus behind uh, the, the anger and the unrest in Russia at the time? So one thing to remember about this period 
was that uh, partly as a result of high oil prices, largely as a result of high energy prices, but also as a result of um, some normalizing of the economy, some early better management of the economy after the wild, wild west days of the early um, post-Soviet period, uh, most Russians are getting richer during the, during the aught years, and life is better, and middle-class Russians are beginning to be able to travel. People are starting small businesses. There are imported goods and imported f films and all of this. And, you know, traditionally, when you have a more open and democratic society, when you have more prosperity, uh, populations begin to want more of a say in how they're governed as well. They want more choice. Uh, they want local candidates who they know. Um, they don't want to be told, um, you know, this is a selection, not an election. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there was pent up demand for more political choice. Um, and uh, so you see people on the street asking for better candidates, asking. Uh, taking issue with the fact that uh, Putin had by then per perfected this strategy of neutralizing anybody who might be a significant uh, political opponent. I mean, the reason that he goes after Khodorkovsky in 2004 is not because Khodorkovsky was so rich or had so much con um, you know, uh, ability to, to, to be prosperous and in, to employ people. It was because that wealth was beginning to buy him influence in the Russian Duma in a way that Putin couldn't control. So Putin wanted to control politics, and people increasingly wanted more choice. And so uh, they went out in support of candidates who were alternatives. And, and it, the way the story gets told now, He's, he gets angry about uh, Secretary Clinton's statements all the way to some people saying it's a motivation for the attack on America in uh, 2016. Tell me about that. Did you draft that s statement? Did I read that right? Um, so he's angry well before that. He's angry throughout the campaign. Uh, because we are doing what we do in a hundred developing countries around the world and what we had been doing in Russia since 1993, which was through uh, the uh, International Republican Institute and the um, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, we had been, um, and um, NDI, the National Democratic Institute, we had been offering uh, political training to every political party in Russia, to Putin's own party, to the communists, but also to Putin's opponents. So our embassy was offering things like how do you use political polling, how do you uh, campaign better, how do you tap into the population. And that again was uh, in the interest in our view of helping create a diverse democratic um, opportunity for anybody who wanted to run, but for Putin, it was seen as a challenge. Now, I think that at the time, uh, he was less worried about that than he was in remembering it later, you know, when he talked about it later. I remember being in a, in a meeting between him and Secretary Kerry in which he talked about that period as the U.S. Embassy running uh, uh, oppositional candidates out of the embassy, which was, of course, ludicrous. We wouldn't do that. We can't do that. But that was his later perception of what was going on. So from his, uh, in his narrative of grievance, uh, we had put our thumb on the scale uh, in favor of his opponents that we had sided with the Balotnaya protesters. Um, we, of course, never choose candidates in any country. Uh, but what we do do in countries that proclaim to be democracies is we offer um, the opportunity for uh, candidates of all kinds to, to learn how to, um, to, to put themselves forward to best, to best effect. And we always 
support the right of peaceful political protest in any country as long as it doesn't become violent. So to him, this was all a challenge to his autocratic desire to control the situation. Now, um, as you know, we're members of the Organization of Se Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the successor organization to the Helsinki um, conference that uh, was founded in 1975 and that uh, Russia is also a member of, which has a number of uh, basic democratic tenets as its covenant, if you will, that elections should be free, that uh, press should be free, that individual human rights should be respected, that courts should be uh, impartial, all of those kinds of things. The OSCE offers a service in all of its 57 member countries, including Russia and including the United States, which is that it audits the freeness and fairness of elections. And it brings monitors and it gives a report at the end. In fact, they monitored the U.S. 2012 elections and the U.S. 2016 elections. So what happened in 2011 was that the OSCE gave the election a very bad report card. They said that the uh, conditions for the balloting were not free and fair, that the conditions for the pre-electoral campaign were not free and fair, that access to media was not free and fair. Now traditionally, every Secretary of State and every President in making a statement after an election anywhere in the OSCE area leans heavily on that statement. So when Secretary Clinton made her statement uh, after the election, we, as we always do, congratulate the Russian people on coming out, but we directly quoted the OSCE's report card that the election was flawed. Um, and he obviously didn't like uh, the fact that Secretary Clinton elevated that judgment, but it was no different than anything uh, any U.S. administration had, had done since the monitoring of Russian elections began in 1993. Uh, or that we did after. Sounds like a red flag to a bull, though, knowing who he is and how sensitive he is to just exactly that kind of thing. Huh? Yes, but if uh, you profess to be a democracy, and if you stay in an organization like the OSCE, which has democratic standards as the basic tenets of membership, and you don't meet those standards, um, then the organization will call you out. Um, so he was trying to have the benefits of membership, um, the legitimacy of membership, without taking responsibility for what that means. It's amazing that the guy carries a grudge like that really across time. If, that's, if, he's still, if that's what he's on about, it's sort of remarkable. Again, I think uh, having watched him over two decades, um, he collects pieces of string to help weave this narrative of grievance that is useful for him politically to maintain his governance structure and to maintain his control in Russia. So at the time, this event or that event might not be that impactful, but by the time he's done weaving his story about how he's the victim, Russia's the victim, Russia, you know, tried and was rebuffed or was its good nature was abused or its outstretched hand was bitten. Uh, all of these pieces of string are useful and they get elevated and they get highlighted in this narrative, which also helps him to maintain uh, power within Russia because there's no other uh, counter perspective that gets through. Yeah. Let's talk about the year 2014 which I think of as if you were Putin and you, you made a film about one year of somebody's life, 2014 would be a pretty wild year to make it. You've got the Sochi Olympics, you've got Crimea and Ukraine, you've got the March 18th speech, you've got a lot of stuff that happens during that time. So let's walk through it a little bit. The, the Sochi Olympics, why, why important to him? Why did he spend $51 billion or whatever it was for it? Uh, what was going on with that? Uh, again, this is a very Soviet impulse uh, 
uh, layered over with Putin's own life experience. But look, Olympics for any country, winter or summer, why do you want to have the Olympics? Olympics showcase your country to the world. And you want uh, to put your best foot forward. You want to get from it uh, um, a, a play, pride of place on the global stage. You also want to get tourism and interest and you know business investment, all those kinds of things. So you want a successful games. Um, so, you know, that is a natural thing. But, and then Putin himself is a big sportsman, you know, his judo and his hockey and all those kinds of things. So he uh, values sport. But there's also his uh, Soviet upbringing, where this thing was a very, very big deal uh, for showcasing his Russia, where he had been the boss for two decades. Um, and frankly, the process of getting there had been very difficult. You know, the building of the village and huge amounts of government resources having to go into preparing the thing. Um, and the timing comes at a very difficult time. But before you get to that, uh, the story of Ukraine starts in 2013. Arguably, it starts well before then. And this is a continuation. His reaction is a continuation of what we saw at Munich in 2007 and reacting with the invasion of Georgia in 2008. And all of that happens when he thinks that both Ukraine and Georgia are moving towards NATO. Um, very quietly in 2010-11, the European Union offers to all of the countries on Russia's periphery who are not already EU members or EU candidates the opportunity for a closer relationship, including a complete free trade relationship and visa-free travel and all these kinds of things, to try to open them, to try to help them uh, democratize, help them be more prosperous, et cetera. And nobody pays much attention. We don't pay much attention, and frankly, Putin doesn't pay much attention. Until 2013, when you're actually in the end game of uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova signing association agreements with the European Union. Uh, and I think Putin wakes up around the same time we wake up, which is in the fall of 2013. We realize what a great opportunity this is going to be uh, in terms of the need for countries like Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine to have more markets that they were going to get in Europe for their people to become uh, more comfortable with democratic processes and with the West through more travel, that sort of knitting together that this EU association offers. And for Putin, it's a direct challenge by then to his leadership model because these countries were looking for increasingly competitive relationships. They were looking for uh, competitive elections. They were looking for um, markets other than Russia, both energy markets, but also markets for their finished products and produce, et cetera. So, and if the, the, the result that the EU desired, namely that these countries began to look more like Germany, came to be, then countries like Ukraine and Georgia would be a direct rebuke to the fact that Russia actually wasn't getting richer. People weren't a get able to travel. They weren't having multiple candidate elections. And so um, he gets worried. He gets worried, and he starts putting serious pressure on Yanukovych, who was then the president of Ukraine and a guy he had created, uh, not to make that choice. And that's what leads to Maidan and later what leads to Crimea. And, and so that as uh, the world is watching slalom skiing and ski jumping and ice skating, uh, the president of Ukraine is fleeing, and, uh, and what is Putin doing? So again, just to roll it back a little bit, 
Yanukovych wanted to associate with the European Union, and he wanted to have that free trade and visa-free, but he also wanted to maintain a strong relationship with Russia, and he said that. And we said that we thought both ought to be possible, and the European Union said they thought both ought to be possible. But here again, Putin's zero-sum mindset, which always causes him to take the position that you're either on my team or the other team. You can't be on both teams. You can't. We can't be on the same team. Um, and so as we got close to that actual signature date the Ukra uh, for the EU association with Ukraine, the Ukrainian economy was in serious trouble. So while the EU was working on association, we were working on trying to help Ukraine get into an IMF program, International Monetary Fund program, so that they would have more economic stability as they made this transition, uh, and so that they could navigate a, a, a good but changed relationship with Russia and a good relationship with the EU. But it was going to require Yanukovych uh, doing business differently. Um, and not stealing so much, opening his books, et cetera. Putin comes along and finds the perfect way to help Yanukovych out of that choice, which is a massive $3 billion loan if he, if he doesn't take the EU path and instead uh, stays with Russia. Now, for Yanukovych, that meant that he didn't have to open his books. He didn't have to. Uh, stop his kleptocratic way of his business model. He didn't have to balance the budget. Um, he didn't have to show his people how money was being spent. Um, and I think he didn't. It didn't occur to him that he wouldn't be able to get Europe, too. Um, and but he takes the short-term way out. Thinks and then the 250,000 Ukrainians hit the street all over the country, including in Kiev. And that's how my dawn starts because they want Europe. And they don't want further dependency on Russia, which this loan was going to create. And so Putin's created a zero-sum choice. Yanukovych falls into that trap. And the Ukrainian people say no, much like the Russian people, uh, or at least some of them, had said in 2011, we want more choice. So uh, you know, Putin has basically said, we're going to stay the way we were. You're not going to improve your relationship with Europe. Um, and Europe is saying, you don't have the right, and we're saying, to choose for Ukraine. And we have this crisis on the street. Um, so at that point in December, January, even early February, Yanukovych is in this frozen trap where he can't figure out how to satisfy his people and Putin and Europe and the West all at the same time. So we and the Europeans began working on some kind of a transitional government where some of the opposition and some of the Yanukovychites would work together or a technical government to try to navigate through this and to try to buy time as well to work with Russia and to say, this doesn't have to be zero sum. Maybe we can improve relations both ways. Maybe Ukraine can be a bridge between Europe and Russia. Maybe Russia can get some benefits out of this in terms of its trade with us, its trade with Europe. Um, but Putin wasn't having any of it, and he exploited the situation to jump into Crimea, um, even though Secretary Kerry did four rounds of intensive diplomacy with Foreign Minister Lavrov to at least try to buy time and say, don't make that choice. Let us try to work through this. Um, but he chose not to do that. Uh, and he did all of it in the context of the Olympics. And so he was sort of challenging the world to legitimize his regime and his choices, which included denying the choices of his neighbors through the Olympics. And we just couldn't do that. Tell me about your phone call and uh, ah, the, the famous barnyard epithet. Yeah. Right. Um, so, as I said, you had had you know upwards of two hundred thousand Ukrainians on the street in the center of Kiev uh, during this Maidan crisis, week on week from the end of November 
well into January throughout the Christmas period. Um, Yanukovych was being pressured by Moscow to crack down violently and uh, dispel the protesters. Uh, we, meanwhile, were trying to keep the protesters uh, in a nonviolent mode and to create some kind of a negotiation between Yanukovych and the Maidan opposition. Um, one of the things that we had been pushing on Yanukovych was either to create a technical government that could try to navigate through this and answer the grievances of the street, get him back on track with Europe, uh, get him out of the trap that Putin had put him in, make it less zero-sum, or um, a sharing of power between the Yanukovych team and the opposition. So uh, we had a, there was a, a very bad violent set of incidents early in January. Uh, where Yanukovych tried to institute changes to the Constitution that would have made it very Putin-esque. There was a violent reaction on the street. There was uh, bloodshed. I think he got scared, um, and he finally started to listen on this idea of uh, sharing power with the opposition, at least to get through this period to new elections. Um, and he, on the day of the famous phone call, which was January 27th, he had just proposed to the opposition that they take the prime ministership and one other ministry in the government. And so the opposition had come to our ambassador in Kyiv to say, um, we're interested in this idea, we want to have negotiations about it, but we have conditions in terms of balanced budget and a democratic process and that we won't be used as pawns. So we need somebody in the international community to be the observer and help midwife these negotiations. We had been trying to get the EU to be the midwife of the negotiations for weeks and weeks, and they were cautious about it. Um, so we had been planning another alternative, which was the UN. So uh, the phone call is about the ambassador saying to me, OK, we finally have a break. Yanukovych has made this offer of a couple of jobs to the opposition, but we need a moderator, um, a moderating force for these negotiations. Do you think the EU will play? And I say, OK, F the EU. We need to move on to the UN because we don't have any time. And the EU had had three weeks to make this decision. So that's what that was about. Um, it was not about a cosmic um, judgment about the EU. It was a tactical, urgent decision to try to get people off the street, get a peaceful government solution. Ultimately, a lot of the things that we were trying to negotiate at the end of January were in the European agreement that Yanukovych signed three weeks later. Um, but then, um, when it actually came time to make the democratic changes that he had agreed to uh, and take that into the parliament, rather than do that, he chose to flee. And the Russians were extremely angry and uh, played it as if neither, nor, neither we nor the opposition had ever intended to live up to that agreement, which simply wasn't true. How did they play the, and what are the implications of them releasing the phone call, the wiretap? Well, it was interesting. Um, and how did you hear about it, and what happened as a result of it? Because it feels to me like the first, maybe it's the first public example of dirty tricks in a new dimension or something. It was. Amazing in a certain sense. Um, you know, at that point, I had been working with Russians on Russian, Russia for 30 years. Um, I knew when we were having the phone call on an open line uh, that Russian intelligence was likely listening. Um, I actually considered that a good thing because it created a certain amount of transparency in terms of what we were trying to do. We were trying to help Yanukovych out of his corner. We were trying to create a win win. We were trying to create a a, a government that could maybe resolve this thing in everybody's interest. Um, so I didn't have a problem with the fact that they were listening. I expected it. Um, and I pr frankly would have briefed them myself if they had asked. Uh, but they had never put a phone call. They hadn't put a, a phone call on the street publicly in 25 years when they did that. 
uh, and uh, you know clearly they were looking to discredit me personally as the main negotiator at that time to thereby reduce U.S. influence. They were looking to hurt me with the Democratic opposition, to hurt me with the Europeans, to get President Obama perhaps to fire me or uh, do less, you know, get out of the way uh, on Ukraine, uh, and none of it worked. Um, I heard about it. I was actually on the ground in Ukraine uh, when, the, when it went live, and we immediately called all the Ukrainians who were the subject of the tape and took a photo of all of us together uh, laughing at this audio file. I, of course, had to publicly apologize and privately apologize to key EU and um, European nation state leaders, which I did, um, and apologize to the president. Uh, but the president, uh, President Obama, was enormously supportive and saw it for what it was, which was an effort uh, by Russia to push the United States out of the di diplomacy business uh, and regain private pride of place in what, the Soviet what, Union. What was the impact? They release it and? Uh, they release it and, and um, you know, I think there was, there was a period of, of turbulence among us. Um, the Europeans then be instantly became more active in the diplomacy. Um, and that was actually helpful because then that agreement of February 21st was midwifed uh, by the Europeans between Russia and Ukraine, something that we had w wanted them to do for many weeks. So I think from that perspective, it was, it was good. From my personal perspective, uh, it made me a little bit infamous, um, which also had its advantages. <laughs> Not toxic. You know, I was lucky that my, that the president and the secretary that I served saw it for what it was and supported me. That didn't have to go that way. And it didn't feel, um, it didn't feel like here's the U.S. proposing candidates in the middle of all of this, uh, fooling around with the, and in a funny way, feeding the uh, Putin narrative about. Well, again, Putin is very, very good at picking up on um, little incidents like this and weaving a narrative that suits his larger political purpose. So in this case, uh, our ambassador in Ukraine was calling me because the opposition was asking us who should serve in these posts. So we were not injecting ourselves. We were not, uh, in fact, imposing any decision. Uh, he and I were brainstorming the various uh, qualities, you know, who could best survive this very difficult situation of serving in the Yanukovych government. But of course, Putin can see that and say, ah, I hear it, there it is. Putin knew exactly what we were doing because he had watched this whole thing and yeah. he had heard the whole phone call. But it was later very useful for him to make me and us the poster child for interference in another country's affairs when in fact we'd been invited. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it happens. Crimea, from southeastern and eastern uh, Ukraine. There's a there's a struggle in Washington about lethal means, about arming the Ukrainians against uh, Russian soldiers and Russian military. Uh, Take me to that argument. Where are you on the scale of, of should we, shouldn't we, uh, and how intense was it all? First of all, I would say that uh, Putin played a weak hand enormously skillfully in the sense that he didn't march into Ukraine after Crimea. I mean, Crimea he just took. But the whole sort of stealth and deniable strategy of the little green men, which we hadn't really seen before and we weren't prepared for, uh, at the same time that he's denying any activity at all, uh, 
So we had a massive information gap. Um, we didn't have the kind of intelligence assets um, where we could prove that he was lying about Russian involvement. We knew internally, we knew as a matter of policy debate, but we weren't doing well in the court of public opinion, let's put it that way, mm. not in Russia, and because we didn't have pictures of the little green men ourselves, we didn't have enough Ukrainians getting pictures, this kind of thing. So by the time, so the first thing that we wanted, uh, those of us who wanted to support Ukraine more, was to get more intelligence assets out there. Um, maybe use uh, U.S. drones, maybe use uh, NATO AWACS, which fly very high. Um, but there was a very strong and, per and, and successful strain in the interagency debate at that point that even if we just did that without getting into the arming piece, uh, that would make us co-combatants on the Ukrainian side, and it would just draw more from Putin. There was also an argument that um, Ukraine meant more to Putin than it did to us, and that he would therefore have escalation dominance. And if we ended up, um, you know, that we weren't prepared for a U.S.-Russia land war over Ukraine. Uh, that's a different matter than later when it was obvious that the Russians were rolling troops and tanks and equipment of their own and trainers into Ukraine we could have given more defensive weapons to raise the cost for them. So uh, I advocated internally things like javelin anti-tank systems, those kinds of things that you can't use to advance militarily, but you can use to stop the other guy's roll across your territory. And? Uh, and the concern was that uh, there were, that we should use non-military means to put pressure on Putin to stop because he would be able to successfully argue that any uh, weapons provision, defensive or non-defensive, again, made us co-combatants and that it would become a proxy war with us and or give Putin an excuse to go further uh, and that we you know, he was, he had already proven himself to be um, relatively reckless and that he might be extremely reckless in that situation. Of course, there's another argument that some people have come in here and said, which is, you don't stop Putin there. You know, where do you stop Putin? When do you stop Putin? That that's the moment. Well, that was the argument that those of us favoring uh, at least defensive lethal systems made was that, you know, if he really wanted it, uh, he would be in Kyiv, and then the next thing you knew, he would be in Warsaw if we weren't careful, um, and that he had to know. So uh, that takes you to the sanctions policy, because at the time, remember, we didn't have a lot of confidence whether sanctions would have an impact and how quickly they would have an impact. So simultaneously to making the argument for defensive lethal or for better intelligence assets or both, um, and training for the Ukrainians, which we ultimately did, but it was very late in the game. We don't begin training the Ukrainians till late in, in 15 to be, to be better. Um, uh, we began working on the sanctions packages and with an escalatory um, effect. And uh, you know, we'd never done partial sanctions before, targeted sanctions. We'd always done, you know, turn off all trade with Iran, turn off all trade with Cuba, which is a relatively blunt instrument. So this was pretty complicated to ensure that what we were doing would have an immediate impact on Russia so that it, and Putin so that it would affect his, his, raise the cost and affect his thinking but also wouldn't overly hurt us or our European allies. So it had to be quite subtle. Um, and, and it was, that was a place where we had full support from President Obama and the team to work it through because it was um, a pretty complicated instrument. Hard for you to lose that argument? Very Personally? Hard. Very hard. Because people were dying. And because I knew that they were fighting on their own soil 
for their own choices, and that the war in eastern Ukraine was completely artificial and Russia created that if, in fact, there were grievances, political and economic grievances of the people of the east of Ukraine, that those grievances could, should have been addressed politically in the context of the new government that emerged. And in fact, that government was ready to address them, was ready to give a lot of political autonomy and decentralization to that part of Ukraine without people having to die. There are some people who tell us the story that this is the proof to him that, uh, you know, you don't have to win whatever win means. You can just create chaos. You can just deplete us in some way. You can have us arguing inside our government about what should we do. And that it leads to, eventually, uh, the incursions into our uh, internet systems, into the cozy bear, fancy bear, all those attacks because he feels emboldened uh, by, uh, by, in essence, the success of those measures in his sphere and the potential success of them to cause at least disruption and chaos. Maybe not elect a new president, a different president, but certainly to send a message to us that there's a new kind of war being fought. Yeah, I think there are two things. First. Uh, Putin perceives us as weak, feckless, indecisive, slow to respond. Um, you know, generally, when you raise the cost for him, he backs off. But it often takes us so long to do that because our process is democratic, our process is consensual, our process often re requires agreement with allies. Whereas he has none of that. He can wake up and, and order X or Y or Z. Um, so, yeah, I think certainly the fact that we didn't do more about cyber after Estonia allows him to keep probing. Uh, the fact that we were very slow to understand all kinds and forms of malign influence in the European theater uh, emboldens him. Um, and the fact that he thinks that our system is fundamentally weak because it requires everybody to agree uh, offers opportunities for exploitation. But more importantly, I think that he successfully calculated uh, that the hammer would not come down on him on a, in a critically painful way um, if he did things d deniably, stealthily, if he probed, um, and if he sort of boiled the frog mm. uh, hotter and hotter and hotter mm. rather than attacking directly. And he was right. So we find ourselves in the, you find yourself in the spring of, or the summer, let's say, of 2016. The intelligence agencies, certainly Mr. Clapper and Rogers, uh, sensing, knowing there were probes, there were, they were in, they were in the DNC, they, they were there, somebody was there. And certainly by summer, they feel pretty certain that it's Russia. And, and when you hear about this, are you pretty certain that it's Russia? Uh, well, remember that we have a lot of experience, right? We have the Estonian incursion in 2010. We have aggressive use of cyber in many forms throughout the Ukraine conflict. Um, we have the attack on the State Department uh, in the fall of 2015. Um, which um, was up close and personal for me. I won't go any further than that. Um, so it was not surprising to me. I learned, I think, in the winter of, you know, before Christmas of 2015, that the Russians were into the DNC, or at least that the DNC had been hacked and it bore a lot of the fingerprints of Russia. Um, remember that. Uh, the intelligence community doesn't publicly certify uh, 
that the Russians helped WikiLeaks acquire the emails until July of 2016, even though the, ha the U.S. private uh, cyber community is well along in saying that by the spring. And more importantly for the way we responded, the U.S. intelligence community does not publicly certify that Russian intelligence was part um, and facilitated the leaking of the stuff back into the U.S., that they were behind Guzifer 2.0 and DC leaks until October. So you have this big delta between uh, the time that large parts of the intelligence community and the private hacker community know it, but we can actually use it in policy. What did you think was happening? Um, based on what we had seen in other places, based on what we'd seen over time, um, I didn't have any doubt that uh, Russian intelligence had played a role in the hacking. I think the question that all of us had throughout the spring and into the summer was what were they going to use it for? Were they just trying to gain compromising information so that later after the elections they would have a way to pressure the incumbent? We also weren't sure whether it was just one team or whether, in fact, they also had the other team so that they were hedging their bets, um, or whether they would do what they ultimately did and what we had seen in other places, which was to participate in pushing the information back in as a way of influencing. And if they did do that, would they tr were they, was their intention just to discredit the system? you know, make democratic elections look bad and messed up and dirty as a way of speaking to their own and saying, you know, they hold themselves up as this beacon of democracy, but look, it's just as dirty and slimy as anything else, so they shouldn't be lecturing to us, and you shouldn't think that you have it worse than them or that democracy would be so great? Or were they actually going to have the temerity to try to put their thumb on the scale of a U.S. election? What constrained the President of the United States from being more aggressive in terms of telling the American people, in terms of going to Putin and doing more than saying, knock it off, whatever he did face to face? Was, were there constraints that you knew about or that you could perceive that he must have been operating under that kept him from being more forceful at a time when some people say he should have been? Uh, I want to be careful here not to speak for the president, um, but my perception was that there were three major reasons why more of this didn't come to light uh, in July and August than later came to light when the intelligence community put out its report. First of all, as I said, in July, the intelligence community was, was ready to certify that the Russians had facilitated the leaking, the pulling of the information out of the U.S., but they were not ready to certify that Russia was behind the reinsertion of the information back into the U.S. body politic, behind Guzifer 2.0 or D.C. leaks. They didn't do that until October. So, the president at that moment was not standing on a firm intelligence community assessment that Russia was going to use this to try to influence the election. That was one thing. But the second thing was, uh, I think there was concern that uh, to put this into the electoral conversation in July and August would be to play into a narrative that candidate Trump was already putting out there on the street that the White House would try to influence the outcome, that the White House would itself put its finger on the scale, that it would cheat or steal in some manner. So if, in fact, you couldn't prove it in July and August, uh, 
but you asserted it, and if you didn't have a firm IC assessment, you could fall into this trap that was being set, potentially, sure. that you yourself had manipulated an election. And I think the last thing, at least my perception was, that the last thing the president wanted to be accused of was in any way uh, influencing the American people's choice. Yes. Very clever on Putin's part as well, um, because President Obama conceivably could have been accused of doing the very thing that Putin himself was doing and therefore contributing to the discrediting of the election. President Obama announces a set of sanctions that throws 35 people out of the country and other things. And Mike Flynn picks up a phone and, and apparently calls, uh, uh, or no, we know this, and calls uh, Kislyak and says, don't overreact. Uh, what's your response to, to that? What does it tell you? I think for those of us in the pre professional service, and those of us who had worked in an interagency way to assemble as much information as we could about what had happened, to put it out in that report, both unclassified and classified. Uh, our hope and expectation was that when the incoming team was briefed, uh, President Trump and his, President-elect Trump and his team, that it would sober them about the challenges ahead with President Putin and with Russia. And we would begin a conversation in a transition way about what the options were to deter this kind of activity in the future. Because you can't ro roll back the clock. You can't change history. But if he's done it, in 2016, he'll do it in 2018 and 2020. And as um, Comey said, I, we had the same thought at the time. This is a nonpartisan issue. Um, Putin is an equal opportunity influencer. So I think what was disappointing was that uh, when the incoming team was briefed, they didn't seem to grab this as a serious strategic threat to the United States and a challenge that needed to be dealt with. Uh, I don't know what was said in those phone calls. Uh, it's absolutely normal for uh, Russia, anyway, to reach out to a new incoming team. They do it every time. They always want a special channel. They always want to get going early. So I wasn't surprised that Kislyak was trying to get to Flynn. Um, I think what we were concerned about was whether in those conversations before the inauguration had even happened, there were policy commitments being made which uh, were being made on the fly without full consideration, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's, that would have been irresponsible. And, and when a team rolls into the State Department, and, and, and when the word is out that the sanctions in, you know, in uh, Ukraine and other things are kind of up for negotiation, where we're going to throw some of this stuff. What is that like for you to see uh, that happening? You know, as a career professional who served five presidents of both parties and went through uh, transitions, both same party coming in or other party coming in, we always cherish that transition period between the election and the inauguration as a chance to begin a policy conversation with a new team and to begin to explain why some of the things were done and what the impact would be. Um, and there was no such conversation. So I think we were concerned that decisions were being made or leaned towards without a full appreciation of either the history of how we got there, uh, the danger of trading off Ukraine for Syria in terms of how it might embolden Putin to push into somewhere else, or uh, giving up 
America's leverage for free. You know, I think a lot of us were prepared to have a businessman as, as president and even thought playing let's make a deal with Russia could serve the larger free world interest, but not to give stuff up for nothing when uh, a whole country and a whole set of democratic choices by the Ukrainian people uh, were being traded off uh, about them without them. What do you know about what the administration does do in response to the growing evidence that uh, Russia is involved in interfering with, with the election? And what did the president do? And are there other things uh, that happened in that fall? So, as I said, we, we had certified from the IC that Russia had, had uh, been responsible for the leaks. Uh, but as early as July, but we didn't clearly have their hand in the leaking of the stuff back into the U.S. But that evidence begins to build through, uh, through the summer, and particularly the way it's happening, and the IC is getting closer to certifying what the private community has already certified and what most of us who have watched Russia for a long time suspect. So throughout August, the case is getting stronger and stronger that Russia's interfering. But then what becomes evident in August is this information that we now know, uh, and we knew then, that Russian intelligence was also interested in getting into the voter rolls at the state level and getting into the company that serviced a lot of the voting machines. So there was extreme concern as to what their capability might be in August, and this is when uh, Homeland Security gets into it with the FBI, uh, and the President asks Homeland Security Secretary Jed Johnson to mentor the various states about the risks and to offer um, cybersecurity training for all of the states. So in by August, uh, when John Brennan goes public that this is serious. Um, we already know not only that they've stolen emails, but that they are using those emails to influence or disrupt the, the conversation, and that they are trying to get into voting machines, but we don't know at that point how capable they will be in that regard. So by the pre time the president has his I think it's his last meeting with, Put with, uh, with Putin, which is at the G20 meeting in Hangzhou, China, in early September. There is real concern at the White House that uh, not only are they seeking to influence the election, but that they might actually have some of the capabilities that they have in their own country to change votes uh, between the time they're cast and the time they're counted. That turned out not to be the case. Uh, but the president concludes uh, that it's time for a very stern warning to President Putin, which he gives one-on-one -on -one at the beginning of September. In that fall, as you're seeing these leaks come out, there's also other things going on uh, with social media that are apparently uh, linked to Russia. And you've seen this in Ukraine and elsewhere. Does it feel familiar? What is it? Um, and, and does it seem like... Uh, uh, how serious does the situation seem as you're wa watching it? Does it seem like the American public understands the nature of what's going on? Uh, as we are watching what's happening, those of us who've seen this movie before, whether it was in uh, Estonia or Ukraine, it seems absolutely familiar. And in fact, I think there's some concern and some fear that we'll see more of the truly malign techniques than we actually saw. For example, uh, in Ukraine and inside Russia and sometimes in Europe, uh, Russian intelligence has been known to doctor emails to make them look uh, even worse than they were originally. And what happens in that situation is the public believes it, and it's very hard to disprove and takes time to disprove. Um, so I think there was concern about just how much they would try to do. Um, I think there was also a lot of concern about the extreme sophistication of what they were leaking, when they were leaking it, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, one candidate and that it that and that they clearly by the fall uh, it was evident that they were not going to be equal opportunity disruptors that they had a horse in the race and was it at all frustrating that this wasn't the top story at the time did it seem like the press and the public understood what was going on um you know it was i think it was getting a a good amount of play the fact that there was a russia connection maybe wasn't getting as much play as it could have whether that would have affected things how much this was affecting voter attitudes was very very hard to measure in October. I mean, in October, uh, you, could, uh, you could argue, based on the polling data in early October and in the middle of October, that in fact it wasn't being very successful and, and was perhaps um, hurting the candidate that it was trying to help, but you know, ultimately we'll never know. My last question is, did you ever have a chance to make a case to the tr incoming Trump administration for sanctions for your understanding of Russia, or you were never talked to? Uh, I did not. I, I had one meeting with the landing party that came to the State Department. Uh, I think it was in December. Each of the assistant secretaries had an hour to brief them on all of the issues that we were dealing with. Uh, but. Uh, I never spoke to uh, Secretary Tillerson or anybody on the team that's serving there, and certainly not to anybody in the White House I wasn't invited to uh, before I chose to retire on January 19th. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? Uh, traditionally, in, and as I said, I've served five presidents and seen 12 Secretary of State transitions and worked on some of them. Uh, the protocol before then had always been for the incumbent Secretary of State, once he's, he or she has been nominated, to come sit in the State Department to prepare for their Senate hearings, to hear from all of us, to get whatever briefings are required, um, but that didn't happen in this case. <laughs> Through this whole narrative, all of these years, American diplomats and experts and people in yourself keep saying, you know, uh, Putin believes CIA runs the world. He has a sort of paranoid uh, impression of the United States and its power. Did we ever try and talk him out of it? Or do you think it was just impossible? Uh, absolutely. You know, he, again, with Secretary Kerry in July, uh, insists that the U.S. tried to defeat him in 2011 and that Secretary uh, Clinton was the architect of that. And Secretary Kerry, again, face to face with President Putin, explains to him that to the degree that we offered election training in Russia, uh, we offered it to every single party, including his. Uh, United Russia, his political party, was one of the biggest users of US electoral training. Um, but it doesn't suit his view of the world. It doesn't fit into his narrative. And I do think that he mirror images. He relies heavily on his own intelligence services as a tool of policy, and he insists, and he insists that we must obviously do the same thing. My last question, what, what do you think Putin wants? Why, why the hacking? Why the, the intrusion into our democratic process? You know, I think that he um, has a need now because of the way he's governing in Russia, which is increasingly autocratic and um, destructive of basic democratic institutions. He has a need to discredit the democratic model, and he has a need to create a certain moral equivalency. You know, our system is dirty and messy, but theirs is really corrupt. Um, you know, look at what was happening inside the Democratic Party with them favoring one primary candidate or another. You know, look at uh, how dirty this politics is. He has a need to do that first for his own people, to discredit our system so that the Russian people don't want it or want it less than they naturally would. Uh, 
but also to create this uh, moral equivalency globally. You know, why should the democracies run the world? They don't do it any better than we do. Um, you know, let's, let's go back to a balance of power world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fun. <laughs>